If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, Hello, right. and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. Part of the mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination and establish true democracy. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we are joined by Jules Boykoff, who has been here before. Jules is the author of Activism and the Olympics, Descent at the Games in Vancouver and uh, London, as well as Celebration Capitalism and the Olympic Games. His writing on the Olympics has appeared recently in places like the New Left Review, The Guardian, The New York Times, and elsewhere. Currently, he's an associate professor of political science at Pacific University. Years ago, he represented the U.S. Olympic team uh, in international competition. So, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good, good. Uh, so. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you mean by uh, celebration capitalism. Sure. Well, I think to talk about celebration capitalism, we first have to talk about what it's responding to, and that's Naomi Klein's idea of disaster capitalism. And in her book called The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, she describes how when there's some kind of big catastrophe, say a coup d'etat or a hurricane, what happens is capitalists capitalize off that catastrophe and really try to cash in. They team up with people within government and they basically try to privatize as much as possible, get rid of regulations or deregulate, and uh, basically they try to install what, what she calls free market fundamentalism or what a lot of people call neoliberal capitalism, privatization, deregulation, let the market decide, so to speak. So what I'm arguing with celebration capitalism in the Olympic Games is that because of the fact that capitalism can be such a nimble shapeshifter and take different forms in different moments, uh, it definitely does that with the political economic organizing of the Olympic Games. And so while Klein talks about there's this state of exception that's a disaster, I talk about the state of exception that's a celebration. The Olympics are this global celebration. And also she says then there's a state of exception disaster that leads to neoliberalism. What I argue is there's a state of exception it's a celebration, and it leads to these public-private partnerships. Not full-on privatization, as with neoliberalism, but public-private partnerships. But the key with it is that these public-private partnerships are, in fact, quite lopsided in the sense that the public tends to pay, and the private, if there's any profit to accrue, the private tends to accrue that profit. Mm -hmm. And so celebration capitalism, as I talk about it, has various component parts. It starts all with the state of exception, as I've just described. Uh, but it also has to do with feelings of sustainability. Um, environmental sustainability has become a new arrow in the International Olympic Committee's quiver of, of rhetoric. And so they talk about how the games are going to be the greenest games to date. And it, that just happens pro forma every time that there's a new Olympics. Uh, there's also this sort of festive commercialism that is, is drummed up to celebrate the games. It's part of this celebration capitalism. So kind of a good example of that would be the um, Olympic torch, which is, is called the torch relay, which travels around the country and to sort of drum up spirit and goodwill among the people. I should say, incidentally, as a sort of historical sidelight, that the torch relay was started in 1936 at the Berlin Olympics under Hitler. Actually, uh, Joseph Goebbels was the person that came mm. up with that idea of the torch relay to sort of propagandize the Olympics and at the same time uh, the Nazi regime. Uh, but there's all these other component parts that, that the media really support it, creating this political spectacle, um, this social relationship between people that is mediated by the International Olympic Committee and the mass media system. And so you see this sort of steady stream of positive articles celebrating how great the Olympics are going to be without taking an honest look at its sort of grizzled underbelly which I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about today. And, l and let me say before we do get into that stuff, yeah. uh -huh. if I may, is that I absolutely love the athletic side of the Olympics. And I watch the Olympics, and I'm an avid fan of these incredible athletes that dedicate their, their lives to being these high-performance athletes. So I, I very much admire that. But at the same time, I'm perfectly willing to look at that grizzled underbelly, that grizzled political economic underbelly. I don't think we have to be devoted to the death of complexity. I think we can hold these ideas in our, our minds at the mm -hmm. same time. Uh, yeah, it, it appears to me that um, uh, 
uh, over the course of the years that the original spirit of the Olympics of bringing people together has been lost due to the commercialization of the Olympics. I think you're right. I think that a lot of people would agree with you on that. In the 1980s, the International Olympic Committee decided that it needed to create some kind of financial stability. It was relying too much on television rights. And so what it ended up doing was creating a worldwide partnership program with huge corporations. So today, you've got corporations like Coca-Cola and McDonald's, not exactly ones that you would maybe associate with the health food of Olympic athletes, but nevertheless, Coca-Cola and McDonald's give over $100 million to be sponsors of the Olympics. Uh, you've got Panasonic, you've got Samsung, you've got Visa. It's become sort of a corporate cornucopia. But, you know, I would also say that, that the Olympics have always been about elitism. Maybe not so much always about corporate elitism, but they have always been about elitism. When they were founded, the sort of modern Olympics were founded back in the 1890s by the French Anglophile, uh, his name was Pierre de Coubertin. He was actually a baron, so Baron de Coubertin. When he founded the games in the 1890s, class privilege was baked into the games. For example, the very definition of an amateur athlete back in those days was somebody who received any kind of payment. So it didn't matter if it was for sports or not. So let's say you were a bricklayer or construction worker and you got paid for your construction work. You would thereby, under those initial definitions of amateurism, you would thereby be ineligible for the mm. Olympics. So it was really an elite affair from the beginning. Now they changed those definitions in the early 1900s, but it was there when, when the Baron got together a bunch of his friends to form the International Olympic Committee. When I say a bunch of his friends, I mean a bunch of his aristocratic friends. Uh -huh. So, you know, it was a bunch of princes and counts and dukes and fellow barons that created this International Olympic Committee uh, back in the 1890s. Huh. So there's been a long history of the games kind of being a lever for elite advantage. It's just happened to take a more corporate flavor oh. in recent years. Oh, okay. Well, that, that, that's really an interesting. I would never have known that, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, talk about the grizzly underbelly. Well, the grizzly underbelly has a, a lot of parts. I mean, one of them is that the Olympics give an opportunity for policing units to weaponize and militarize their weapon stocks. So police units basically treat the Olympics like their own private ATM, getting all the weapons that they could ever have dreamed of and that we aren't able to get during normal political times. And so, for example, say the 2010 Vancouver Winter Olympics, uh, police there got themselves a medium range acoustic device. Medium range acoustic devices or MRADs are military grade weapons used in, they're battle tested in war zones like Iraq. And basically they look like uh, little satellite dishes and you can turn them toward your target and crank up the lever and it, it beams the sound toward your target, basically neutralizes them by, by painfully uh -huh. almost shattering their, their eardrums. So, you know, they, they would never be able to just pick up one of those during normal times, but they got an MRAD during the Olympics. Uh -huh. In London, they got what an would, LRAD. Yeah, what would, what would the ju justification for doing that during the Olympics be? Uh, did they expect to have people in the street rioting that they would have to control? Well, actually, the, the reason that is most given, and it's a legitimate reason, let's face it, is the possibility of terrorism. Because the Olympics are such a big thing, they have become a big target for terrorists. Take the 1972 Olympics in Munich, uh, where a group called Black September of Palestinian militants came in and took the Israeli athletes uh, and mm -hmm. kidnapped them and then tried to escape and everybody was gunned down on the airport tarmac as they tried to escape. So, you know, we can't deny the fact that it has been a target for terrorism in the past. Same thing with the current Olympics in Sochi, 2010 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia. A guy named Doku Umarov, a Chechen rebel uh, leader, has said that the, tar the Olympics are a perfectly reasonable target for, for terrorist action. So um, there's that, and the police forces use that as a reason to bulk up on their weapon stocks. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of it, and they don't usually say it quite like that, but the flip side of it is that these same weapons that are used to combat terrorism can also be used to squelch political dissent and to engage in the kind of crowd control you were alluding to if mm -hmm. there were demonstrations and that sort of thing. So you can say they're for terrorism, but they could very well be used for activism. Right. So 
So they then have it in their arsenal for after the Olympics have, have, have concluded, they've still got the weapons in there. And that's another key point, David, that, that they do have these weapons afterwards. And, and the word arsenal that you used is a really good one because the weapons that they get are pretty amazing. I mean, in London at the 2012 Olympics, they ratcheted surface to air missiles on the tops of people's apartment buildings and, and a handful of locations around London. And how did the people who lived in these apartment buildings learn uh, that they were having missiles ratcheted to their roofs. They came home from work one day and there was a brochure under their door that said, oh, by the way, uh, you have now, or you're going to have surface-to-air missiles, uh, Star Streak and Rapier surface-to-air missiles ratcheted to your roof. So it really is an arsenal. I mean, uh -huh. 10,000 plastic bullets purchased by the Metropolitan Police in London. Um, the, the biggest warship was docked along the, along the River Thames in London. And same goes now, it's pretty much standard practice, the militarization, the fortressification of the public sphere to host the Olympics. And this is happening in Sochi? Absolutely, and I think, again, there's, there's good historical reasons why people in Sochi would be nervous. I, I just mentioned Doku Umarov, who's made, who said that the Olympics are, are happening on the bones of, of his ancestors and, and seen as a desecration of, of his history. Um, there's there's all sorts. Uh, basically, Sochi is a geopolitical tinderbox. The games are happening 25 kilometers from Abkhazia, which is a disputed region between Russia and Georgia that they've been in dispute over for a long time. Uh, you've got the Chechnyans who aren't happy. You've got Dagestan not too far away. Uh, and you've got lots of people that are not happy about the, the Russians hosting the games. Another group that I think is, is really interesting and, and should be talked about more are the Circassians, who in the 1860s uh, were kicked out of Russia by the Tsar, the second Tsar, Tsar Nicholas II, and they have had to live in diaspora since then. And so they, they consider what happened to them a brutal genocide, and they use that word too. So there's a long history of geopolitical problems in this very region along the Black Sea mm -hmm. where the Sochi Olympics are happening. So I mean, I think that's why Vladimir Putin, in part, that's why he's been able to get away with it. In part, it's also because he's essentially running a finger-snap democracy. Vladimir Putin snaps his fingers and things start to happen. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, Khodorkovsky got released from jail mm -hmm. just at the whim of, of uh, you know, an amnesty clause that's sure the Duma passed, but it's at the behest of Putin. The people from Pussy Riot, the, the um, punk rock band that were in, in prison there in Russia, also released. The Greenpeace 30 had been engaging in activism around climate change. Finger snap, boom, they're gone. So they don't necessarily have the same sort of democratic restrictions uh, that other countries that have hosted the Olympics have had. Now, that's not to say that under celebration capitalism, those democratic principles aren't often just tossed right out the window because they are. Same for Naomi Klein's disaster capitalism. Mm -hmm. That's what she talks about, how it's sort of an anti-democracy device. Same thing exactly for celebration capitalism. And we're seeing it big time right now in Sochi. Okay. Yeah. So should we expect to see any kind of activism in Sochi at all? That's a great question. I mean, it, it's hard to say, but Putin has set it up, and the Duma, Russian Duma, has set it up in a way where it would be very difficult to engage in street protest around the Sochi Games. Mm -hmm. For starters, in the lead up to the Games, there have been a number of laws that have been passed where, for example, if you're an NGO that receives money from a foreign group, you have to register with the government and be considered a foreign agent, which carries with it all sorts of negative connotations. Um, there are big fines associated with groups that hold uh, protests that aren't officially sanctioned and they haven't gone through the permitting process. Huge fines. You can find yourself in jail. So, in fact, actually, President Putin said a few months ago that there would be no protest allowed between January 7th and March 21st, which basically created a one-month buffer on either side of the Olympics. Now, since then, he's backpedaled. And he said that they're going to set up these protest zones where people can uh, express their dissent should they desire. But these protest zones are about 12 kilometers, which is about seven and a half miles from the nearest Olympic site. And you have to apply to gain entrance to them, giving all this information about you, which many commentators have said. Basically, these so-called protest zones are, are basically activist snares 
more than they are vibrant spaces mm. for actual political dissent. So no, I don't think we're going to see, I, I'm, I'm happy to be wrong on this, but I don't think we're gonna see a lot of street protests in Russia around the Sochi Olympics. But one place where we might see some interesting activism is from athletes themselves. Now, a lot of attention has been given to a law that was passed and signed by President Vladimir Putin last summer that is considered to be anti-LGBTQ. Basically, the law says that you cannot teach propaganda about non-traditional sexual relations to a minor, so anybody under 18. If you talk or teach about anything having to do with gay rights or being gay or anything like that, uh, that is now considered a crime if you do that with somebody under the age of 18. Now, there's been a huge public outcry around that. And there's been many athletes who have said, we're not going to stand for this. This is crazy talk. I mean, there, there's a skater from New Zealand who has said he is going to do some sort of interesting protest. There is an Australian snowboarder named Bell Brockhurst who just came out of the closet not too long ago as a lesbian who may well do something as well. And there are a lot of athletes from the United States who live in places in the United States where it's perfectly uh, it's perfectly acceptable and reasonable to be in a homosexual relationship. So there's this sort of culture clash and they, they sort of can't believe, well, why wouldn't somebody be able to be with the person they love? So somebody coming from a culture where it's, it's just part of the fabric of life may go to Russia and decide that they are going to speak out. So we could have a really interesting athlete activist moment of the variety that we haven't had in a long time. Some of your viewers may well remember 1968 and the Mexico City Olympics uh, where famously John Carlos and Tommy Smith uh, thrust their their fists into the Mexico City sky while Peter Norman the Australian sprinter stood by in solidarity wearing an Olympic project for human rights button and that is an iconic moment of dissent not just Olympic history but in dissent forever. It's an iconic moment. And I think that right now the table is set for another sort of iconic moment like that. I mean, how, how much more could history telegraph itself than it is in this moment? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I think that what Carlos and Smith did was, was actually pretty amazingly courageous and they paid a serious price for it. Not pretty amazingly courageous, totally amazing and courageous. And they paid a price for it. The International Olymp Olympic Committee kicked them out of the Olympic Village. They, they, they came home and they had a hard time getting work. I think if somebody were to protest this anti-LGBTQ law, they would not face the same kind of pushback when they got back home to the United States mm -hmm. that Smith and Carlos faced back then. Mm -hmm. So I think what we might see is a really interesting moment of activist, um, athlete activism of, of the type we haven't seen in a while. Yeah, have there been those kinds of of, of moments prior to was it sixty eight, uh, or, or or was that just a standout event? Well, there have been many examples of activism in relation to the Olympic Games. One just that happened just before that was a group of people from South Africa that used the Olympics to fight against the apartheid regime. And they started the South African Non-Racial Olympic Committee, SANROC, as sort of an alternative to the official Olympic Committee in South Africa that was utterly racist. Mm. And this unofficial SANROC group uh, pushed mightily and teamed up with people around the United States, including Jackie Robinson, Oscar Robertson, Wilt Chamberlain, Arthur Ashe, many prominent athletes from the United States who teamed up and said, we can't have this apartheid system. And so they used the Olympics as a leverage point, mm -hmm. and it worked. I mean, mm -hmm. the International Olympic Committee didn't want to do it, but they did end up having to expel South Africa from the Olympic movement right before the 1968 Olympics. They weren't reinstated until 1992 when they got to participate in the Barcelona Games. And so there have been many instances like this where athletes have spoken out. The key is to have strong movements around them, mm -hmm. movements that create space, rhetorical and political space for athletes to speak out and have it be more safe for those athletes mm -hmm. to speak out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we see right now around LGBTQ issues in the United States, a strong movement. The tide has changed in a massive way and it's continuing to change across the United States. That creates space for athletes to come in and to do the right thing and to be courageous. 
and to take a stand. And so, yes, there have been many instances of it. There's been also some instances that are, have been maybe considered athlete activism, but maybe that wouldn't fit so well with the themes of your program here about corporate dominance, because at the 2012 Olympics, there were a bunch of athletes that were protesting a rule from the Olympic Charter called Rule 40. And Rule 40 basically says that during the Olympic Games, athletes cannot engage in advertising. And what they mean by that is advertising of other brands that aren't actually Olympic sponsors. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so if your Olympic sponsor is Brooks uh, Running Shoes, as is the case right now with a runner who has been running in Oregon for a long time named Nick Simmons, um, you cannot go to the Olympics and promote Brooks during that time period. And so what you saw at London 2012 was a bunch of athletes who were saying, hey, we want to be more commercial, and this is one of our big chance to do it. And so they protested that Rule 40. Now, that for me is, is no Tommy Smith, John Carlos no, moment. Not, no, it but, is a measure. <laughs> but it is athletes kind of cutting against the grain, uh -huh. and I don't take that for granted either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, I like the idea of, of anybody cutting against the grain, uh, but some of them I certainly support much more than, than others. Uh, you know, when you're cutting against the grain in order to promote, promote commercialism, well, that doesn't exactly fit with, it. you're correct, with the mission of Alliance for Democracy of this program. Right. Yeah. So um, the Olympic Committee has always tried to portray itself uh, as uh, being above politics. Uh, I presume that you don't agree that that's what they should do? I agree that they've always tried to do that, uh, but the truth is that their claims that the International Olympic Committee and the Olympics more generally are above politics is a fairy tale that they tell each other around the evening fire to make themselves feel better. Because the Olympics have been always a political affair through and through. Look at the flags check out the marching, check out the national anthems that are played. What about the sort of corporate sponsorship selection? Those are obviously political considerations. What about the host city selection? Is that not political? I mean, we were talking before about 1936 Berlin, mm -hmm. and how could that not be construed as a political selection, as a place to hold the Olympics? I was really curious about how Sochi got picked, uh, you know, when they're in such a uh, cauldron Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, conflict, uh, why, why would the Olympic Committee select that? Well, and not only is it that cauldron of conflict, but it's also the first time the Winter Olympics will be held in a subtropical place. Uh, yes. So there, it seems an odd selection mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. But Vladimir Putin showed up in 2007 when they were making their selection, when the International Olympic Committee was making their selection, and he pushed hard for the games. Mm -hmm. And that matters when it comes to site selection for the International Olympic Committee, the people that show up. Tony Blair did the same thing to get the London 2012 oh. games. Mm -hmm. And so those little personal touches can matter. And it certainly helped when it was Vladimir Putin coming in and saying, these Olympics are going to be the safest games ever, they're going to be the best games ever, they're going to be the greenest games ever. And it sounded pretty good coming out of mm -hmm. his macho mouth. And they said, OK, we'll give you the games. And they did. <laughs> and so here we are in this really interesting uh -huh. moment. OK, well, I guess in, uh, in a few weeks, we'll see how it all plays out. We will, yeah. All thank right. you for being here. OK, thank good. you, David. All right. So our guest today has been Jules Boykoff, who's an associate professor in the Department of Politics and Government at Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, and author of the new book, Activism and the Olympics, Dissent at the Games in Vancouver and London. Uh, that book will be released uh, in June of this year. So uh, remember to get a copy. Uh, look out, world. The Obama administration and the 1% are about to unleash a new and more frightening version of the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA, on the world. Uh, that new agreement is called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. NAFTA is 20 years old now, and we know its record as a new public citizen report, NAFTA at 20 states. NAFTA has met 1 million U.S. jobs lost, mass displacement and instability in Mexico, record income inequality, and scores of corporate attacks on environmental and health laws. NAFTA and other corporate trade agreements like CAFTA and the Obama enacted agreements with Panama, 
Colombia and South Korea have meant a direct attack on the ability of governments to, to govern in our interest. With that record, why would we want to expand it to cover over 40% of the world's economy? Now the Obama administration has called for undermining the democratic process by asking Congress for fast-track authority. Congress is constitutionally required to regulate trade with foreign nations. Yet Obama now asks Congress to cede its responsibilities to the executive branch in order to grease the approval process through Congress for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other such agreements now being negotiated. The time is now to say no to this latest 1% scheme. Call your U.S. representative and your two U.S. senators with this message. Do your job. Don't give it away to the president. Oppose fast-track authority for the negotiation of so-called free trade agreements. Just say no to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populistdialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notification. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you to Roger Bates, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thank you to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, Now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock. Cause I never heard my money talk. When a corporation has a colonoscopy, then I'll believe they're human like me.